Greetings and welcome to this edition of Bear in Mind, a regular series of conversations with UC Berkeley's Chancellor, Robert Bergenau. I'm Dan Mogola from the University's Office of Public Affairs, and today we'll be talking about an interesting and important trend, the growing number of students on campus who either come from abroad or have participated in study abroad programs. This fall, just over 4,000 international students from more than 100 countries are studying here, and about 1,000 Berkeley students are expected to participate in the UC Education Abroad program during this academic year. We'll be discussing the import and impact of these numbers with Chancellor Bergeno and four students with international backgrounds. Annabel Sanchez Talavera is an undergraduate from Peru. Beat Schwendemann is a PhD candidate who hails from Switzerland, and they'll be joined by two recent study abroad participants, Seema Rupani and Andy Sun. Now, Chancellor, before we talk to the students, I know that this trend is something that you support and believe in, and if I'm not mistaken, in your own student years, you had a formative experience in this regard. Tell us a little bit about that. So I actually had two significant experiences. First of all, of course, I was a foreign student myself who came to the United States uh, from Canada, uh, which may seem not very far away, but actually, especially the culture I grew up in was very far away, couldn't have been further away. Uh, I lived in an international house with students from Indonesia, from France, from England, from, uh, from, from India, uh, and that uh, by itself was an, uh, an exciting experience. My second international experience was then having been to a certain extent Americanized. <laughs> I then went off to England where I was a postdoc at Oxford, uh, and that was the middle of the Vietnam War. And there, I would say, the immediate shock was turning on the television and watching French footage uh, of what was going on in Vietnam and seeing the difference between what was allowed to be shown on American television and what was appearing on British television, which then immediately, uh, might even say, radicalized me in terms of my attitude towards, towards the war. Uh, and both of those experiences were extremely in informative. Also, Oxford, frankly, was just a very exciting place because Oxford uh, already at that time was a truly international university, and I was able to establish friendships with people from Peru, actually, one of my, uh, in fact, uh, good friends there that I ended up selling my car to was from Peru. Uh, and and uh, uh, there were students from Australia, students from the United States, of course, and, and uh, uh, of course, British students themselves. So uh, all of that, I think, you know, contributed in a really significant way to my own growth as a person and my own understanding of what education is and what education could be. So now as a chancellor, how have you taken that experience I and mean, how has that experience informed your support and your belief in the importance of, if you will, a globalization of the campus? Right. Well, we obviously live in a global universe, even much more so than when I was in school in the, in the 60s. And uh, it was uh, uh, the president of the University of Mexico actually said to me in the context of Mexico that he thought the single most important thing for a student in this century to learn was what he called intercultural competence, which is he said that the successful people in the 21st century would be people who could move comfortably between one culture and another. And so I think our students here at Berkeley should have that opportunity as well to gain intercultural competence. One way obviously is to go abroad, as two of our students uh, did, and gain international experience very directly and bring it back with them. The second is for international students to come here as both undergraduates and graduates it benefits them, but it also benefits every single uh, other student that they talk to and that in the classes they can bring an international perspective, a South American and European perspective in this case. Uh, and so I think it's also uh, extremely valuable for our people born and brought up in California uh, to have international students in the classroom with them. So uh, let's actually talk to the students at this sure. point. This is sort of the main event, and um, Annabelle, I'm going to start with you. So tell me a little bit. You're from, uh, you're from oh, Peru. Peru. Yeah. And uh, tell me a little bit about why you came to Berkeley and how you feel your presence here contributes to both the culture of the campus, to the classroom situation. Talk to us a little bit well, about that. Well, uh, I came here mainly because uh, my major was um, biology, and I, I knew that UC Berkeley had a very good program with biology. Um, so that's why I came here. Yeah. 
<laughs> yeah. And what, what do you think, how does your perspective, do you bring a different perspective to some of your classes? Do you find yourself contributing, contributing in a unique fashion as a result of your origins? Uh, I, I, mainly, I think it's just kind of trying to break stereotypes that people have most of the time about South America, which are kind of, you know, ridiculous. Um, and, you know, just trying to, you know, speak out and say them aloud, mm -hmm. you know. And that, I think that's very important. Yeah. Biat, you're, you're from Switzerland, and I know that's a country that comes with its own set of stereotypes, and so I'm interested a little bit about why you came here and what your experience has been on campus and what you think the presence of folks like you actually adds to the community educationally and culturally. Um, yeah, I'm here on a Fulbright scholarship, and I chose Berkeley for a particular reason, because Berkeley is one of the most international universities and has a great reputation in education research. and so I was very interested to learn about the culture in Berkeley at, in general and then also learn, um, become a part of the intellectual culture at the School of Education where I'm located. Um, one of the reasons why I was very interested to come to the U.S. is because Switzerland and the U.S. share a lot of similar problems. Um, both have a, a lot of international people come to the country um, as young students who need to be kind of integrated into the existing culture. And it was, it, as I was very interested to learn how the US deals with this, because Switzerland has a, has a very similar pro, um, issue. Um, and so it's, it's, for me, it's very interesting to see across um, what, how other cultures come up with solutions for similar problems. Seema, a little bit about your experience. You were on study abroad, I believe, last spring. Where were you? Why did you go? What did you bring back? I uh, did study abroad in South Africa, in Cape Town, and um, I actually chose that country because my mom is South African, but I, hadn't, I didn't have much of a connection with the country growing up in America. I'd only been there a couple times to visit family, and I didn't feel like I got to actually explore the country on my own. So I decided to take advantage of the study abroad program and go there, and um, also because I'm studying international sustainable development and conservation and global poverty, I felt like um, I really needed to get some in the field experience uh, that I couldn't get inside the classroom. And so aside from the, the educational benefits of being abroad, what, what did you bring back with you? That you how, did, how have your perspectives changed in the way you interact both in class and out of the class? Um, I definitely think that I realized my ability as well as my responsibility to, to keep a global international perspective in any work that I do here um, and any activism that I'm doing locally. Interesting. And like the comments that I've made in class have been, uh, I mean, I'm, because I'm studying international sustainable development and because I was able to actually go to South Africa and like work in the field and do internships and, um, and kind of be in a country that's in that, that transition to sustainable, develop, to sustainable development, it was um, nice to be able to come back and like, and give insightful comments in my classes about my experience abroad and how that relates to our perspective in, of su sustainable development. Mm -hmm. Andy, I think you were in Hong Kong, right? Tell yes. us a little bit about why you went there, what you brought back, what it's meant to you. Sure, so I was born in Shanghai and grew up in Boston and came to California when I was around seven years old. So I've had a relatively good amount of international experience before I studied abroad, but never had I uh, went abroad under an academic setting. And as a undergrad in the Haas School of Business, I was given an opportunity under the global management concentration to really take advantage of the study abroad requirement and go to Hong Kong. So I chose Hong Kong because in, at Haas, we're sitting in classes and all we hear about is Asia and the burgeoning economy and how the future lies within China and Asia. So I thought it would be a great experience to go to Hong Kong and uh, experience that firsthand. And the collaboration, uh, the collaborative culture at the university and the ability to work with people from all around the world in group projects in an academic setting was really an invaluable experience. So I'm interested for many of you, the Chancellor brought up at the beginning this idea of intercultural competency. What, what does that mean to you and how have your experiences either as study abroad participants or people who've come from abroad, what does that mean to you and how important do you guys think that is in terms of your ability to succeed and thrive in the world when you leave the campus? I think it's, um, it's, it's mostly about being respectful with other cultures and I think it's something very, very, very hard to achieve because there's lots of issues that you have to take into account, you know, like you know, things of privilege, like where you come from, your background, like, you know, if you go to a country which it's poor, then you kind of have to kind of deal with that privilege that you have, you know, so I think it's, I think it's very hard to, to obtain that through um, EAP, but I think it's something, 
IAP, but I think it's something that really helps though, you know, trying to figure out other cultures and be respectful and open-minded. Yeah. Biat, do you want to say something? Yes, uh, that's actually very similar to my experience. Before um, coming to Berkeley, I spent six months in India working for a school development project in a rural part of India. Uh, that was one of yeah, my life-changing experiences because I really was thrown into this very different culture. And, and so to me, intercultural competency means two things. It means respecting the other, learning to respect the other culture in, in a non-judgmental way as well as still retaining your own identity and, f and see how ideas you have could maybe help in this culture and the ideas this culture has could work in your culture. <coughs> While being sensitive that ideas and like, solutions are often culture dependent, but often you can, you can learn a lot from each other. I'm going to come to Andy and see him in just a second, but Chancellor, I know you're more than just an administrator, you're also a professor here and you're, you're still teaching. From your perspective as a professor, how does that add to the, to the class or the lab situation when you have, even in the sciences, when you have students from different geographical backgrounds? So currently in my lab, uh, I actually have an American <laughs> graduate student uh, from Maryland. Uh, I have a uh, uh, postdoc from Romania. I have two students from, uh, one from, actually one from Beijing, uh, but another from a rural and very poor area of China their differences are as big as the difference with the Romanian, actually, which is by itself quite interesting. Uh, and then I have another student from, from Britain. Uh, and, and, you know, just watching the interactions between them. And then also interesting, even though, you know, we're doing uh, quite basic research in physics, they tend to bring different perspectives which come from and different cultural approaches to how you do research, uh, which I think makes my research group, you know, much stronger than it, than it would be otherwise. Plus, frankly, it just simply is enjoyable. I mean, we, we can discuss any subject, right? And so I get a European perspective, I get a British perspective, and I get uh, uh, an Asian perspective, and I get an American perspective, and I still have enough Canadian in me that I bring a Canadian perspective as well. Uh, and so, uh, uh, you know, it provides a rich environment. Plus, I, I always have some number of undergraduate students uh, in, in my lab. For some reason, it's transfer students who are often international, who seem to prefer to work in my, la in my lab. So my laboratory is almost entirely, uh, entirely international. Seema, I'm curious, um, you know, you had some ties, some familial ties to South Africa, so I'm sure on a personal level it was a profound experience and also educationally. What about when you came back? Your perspective changed? Did the way you interact with people, the type of contributions you made in the class, what was the impact when you came back? What did you notice? Well, one thing that I've been thinking about is um, you know, I think that the study abroad program is extremely valuable, and I also think that it's important to have an international student presence on campus. But the 1960 master plan um, did outline the role of the UC, the CSU, and the JCs to ensure every Californian a seat in higher education, an affordable seat in higher education. Um, and while I think that having an international student presence on campus is really important, UC Berkeley has the highest proportion of non-California students on campus. It's 22%, and that's double the proportion. Our freshman class, 22% of them are non-California students, are non-California residents, and that's about uh, double the proportion of last year. Um, and I think that's leading to diminished access for students from California. So I do think that um, that's something that we need to, to think about. Chancellor, those are interesting oh, comments. No, I think these are important comments, and these are obviously competing values. Uh, actually, the number of out-of-state international students is 11 percent, although it's much larger in the incoming class. So overall, in the undergraduate student body, it's 11 percent. Uh, and the, uh, we actually, for the last while, have been over-enrolled in terms of the number of Californians, so we've been above uh, the threshold. So the uh, increase in the out-of-state international students has been entirely by over-enrollment. So there have been no Californians actually re uh, replaced. Uh, and I couldn't agree with you more that we have to uh, meet our commitment to California and our commitment to uh, incorporating all of the populations of California. Uh, one of the uh, interesting aspects, actually, this year as we've increased via over-enrollment the number of out-of-state and international is we actually have the largest number of low-income Californian students by a lot at Berkeley this year in our entire history. So partly because of the increased resources, uh, we're actually able to accommodate more mm -hmm. low-income people. 
uh, than we ever have been able to before. Before, so we've actually increased the economic diversity as opposed to decreasing it uh, on the campus. Uh, the other thing is that the uh, increased fees from out-of-state international students has enabled us uh, to invest significantly more money in outreach uh, in order to increase to uh, access populations that are currently underrepresented at the university. So, uh, so although there are competitions, as you as you just said, we've actually are doing our best to turn it into a win-win situation, which so far is actually working. You know, we were talking about, and, and it's interesting. I think is just as a side note that. 60% of the students who participate in, in, study, in the study abroad program are Pell Grant recipients. So we're finding a lot of students who come from financially challenged families who are you know, taking advantage of that opportunity. Um, and it's neither here nor there whether you fall into that category, but it's clearly something that's being embraced to, by a lot of students to expand their horizons. So on the subject of intercultural competency, I'm wondering when you came back, how you found your own perspectives changed and the manner in which you interacted with your fellow students or professors had changed. Yeah, so I, I'd like to take intercultural competency to a newer level, a higher level actually. I would see it as cross-cultural comfort. Not only are you competent, but you're comfortable and you're enthusiastic to embrace new situations, new cultures, and experience new things. So when I came back, I had a whole new perspective on business in Asia and I was able to contribute positively to my classes at Haas, make insightful comments and work in collaborative projects that really harnessed what I learned in Hong Kong. So I thought that was particularly uh, valuable, that experience I received in an academic setting. Mm -hmm. um, Biad, I know you're interested, you're a PhD candidate, right? And interested in being an educator. Mm -hmm. How is this experience of having crossed cultures, of having come to Switzerland, to, to the United States, to, to study at Berkeley, how do you think that's going to influence you as an educator, having have it made or a, perhaps a more nuanced appreciation of cultural differences, the way students learn, the way they interact? Learning about education has, has a lot of different levels, um, both professionally and personally. Um, I learn, um, well, on a personal level, I learn about, a lot about education system just by talking to other international students and to American students, learn, uh, to talk about their educational experiences. Um, I uh, live at the International House, uh, which is as international as it gets. Um, and so I talk a lot to the, uh, other students about their, in their education experiences and um, a lot of, yeah, in different countries they have different approaches to how to educate people. Um, like in Asia they have a very competitive culture where the students compete with each other and try to finish as quickly as possible in other cultures. There's a lot more um, like in the U.S., for example, people have a lot of alternative ways. Um, they go sometimes into a, a job and come back to academia later, and so you get a lot of older students. Whereas Asia has a lot of uh, the student population is, is generally younger, mm. um, and, uh, and and Europe has a, an extreme diversity of different education systems. Every country has a very different system. Um, and so for me, it's different, interesting to compare them with each other. So last question that I'd like both of you to answer. For, people, for other students who might be considering or just becoming aware of study abroad, what do you say to them? What's the advice that you would give to people who are kind of thinking about that possibility sometime during their academic I'd career? I definitely encourage them to study abroad um, as long as they can until you know, we run out of money for study abroad programs. Mm -hmm. Andy, what do you think? I would say it's one of the best decisions I've made in my life. Um, I've acquired such a large network of international students that I've met abroad. Um, I can close my eyes and put my finger on a map, and uh, chances are I would know someone who, or you know, have a friend I met in Hong Kong who lives there. And I already had a lot of international friends come and visit me, and I'll be visiting them in the near future. So expanding your network is a great thing. Chancellor, closing thought from you, please, just about w what you've seen of the benefits, where you think we're heading, and, and what do you think this level of, you know, sort of international representation on campus is really, is really mm -hmm. resulting in? So, I, you know, I think just as these examples going both ways, right, I think it's really important to have perspectives from different directions. Uh, uh, my vignette is on healthcare. I went crazy during the healthcare debate uh, when I had to listen to these condemnations of of uh, universal health care in my life. I've lived in Denmark and England and in Canada and the United States. Three out of the four of those countries have got, have got social safety nets and have got uh, health care systems that work tremendously well. Uh, I think just even uh, at my level, being able to share that perspective with other people and that there are different approaches to, uh, for example, health care, I think is critically important. Uh, I think in terms of 
Uh, for example, uh, you know, debates about the Middle East. I think those debates on campus would be advantaged if we had more students from Iraq and from Iran, from Saudi Arabia, from back. Pakistan people actually grew up in those cultures, right? I, I, I think the, it would be a much more informed discussion. So my own view is I would like to see our undergraduate body, graduate and un undergraduate bodies, uh, have broader international representation, I think. E everyone for, would profit from that. At the same time, I also agree with SEMA, obviously, which is that we have to meet our obligations to the people of California uh, and to represent both all of the different diversities in. Uh, in, 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 Cal in California, uh, racial, ethnic, religious, and, uh, and economic. So I want to thank you all for coming, for participating, for sharing some wisdom, sharing some experiences. Thanks, everybody, for joining us today, and we'll see you next time on the next edition of Bear in Mind. Mm -hmm.